لما يا مخلوق آثرت الجحود كنت معدوما فمن أين الوجود آهي الصدفة أم رب الودود آهي الصدفة أم رب الودود قبله في الكون من بعده بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله محمد وآله وأصحابه أجمعين we begin again with another one of our discourses and classes that is in the, on the tafsir of the Holy Quran. And we had started verses of Surah Dukhan, we had completed until verse 8, in which it is stated Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned to mankind, mentions to mankind, and he mentioned to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to tell the people to whom he came. He said, none has the right to be worshipped but he that Allah alone is the one deserving all worship. That was in verse 8. It says, it is he who gives life and causes death, your Lord and the Lord of your forefathers. So in the very first part of the ayah, none has the right to be worshipped, but he, la ilaha illahu. There is no other God but Allah. He alone is the one who deserves all worship. It is he who gives life. It, it makes it very clear to the people that Allah is the giver of life and he causes death and he is the taker of life. So he gives life and he takes life. Your Lord and the Lord of your forefathers, that Allah is your Lord and he is the Lord of your forefathers. To make it very clear to them that just as Allah is their creator, then all those who went before them from their parents and their grandparents and their ancestors and all those who came in the beginning the creator was none other than Allah. So just as Allah created them, Allah created those in the past. But Allah says, but notwithstanding this, this teaching that has come to them, and these teachings that have come over a period of time, uh, from one prophet to another prophet, and it went down to generations, uh, one after the other, Allah says, nay, they play in doubt. Nay, they play in doubt, means notwithstanding all the signs and evidences and all the, all the miracles that were performed by prophets and everything that they have asked for, they got it because the people used to demand miracles from the prophet, from the prophets and the prophets will tell them. But notwithstanding that, the people still continue to be doubtful. They were playing in doubt. In other words, they paid no attention. And play is another word for saying that they paid no attention to what was serious and what was haq and what was the truth. And they played, they continued to play in whatever they considered to be the truth, but yet they were doubtful. This is why Allah says they play in doubt. This verse explains, as it is stated as the commentary, this verse explains that although many evidences and teachings were given to the polytheists regarding Allah and his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the polytheists remained in doubts and disbelieved in the message which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brought to them. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet and although many evidences, one after the other were given to them, and the teachings were given to the polytheists, yani the mushrikeen, those who committed shirk, and worshipped more than one God. They, they were given these things regarding Allah and His Messenger. And who was the Messenger in this case? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yet, the mushrikeen and the polytheists, they remain in doubts and disbelieved in the message which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brought to them. They disbelieved in it. The verse states, nay, they play about in doubt. It means that they have absolutely no faith, Iman, in what has been preached to them that Allah is their Lord and they remain doubtful regarding the matters of resurrection and judgment. So they disbelieved in Allah. They did not accept one God as their creator and about the matters of what will happen after death, about resurrection and judgment, they remain doubtful. Thus, they play and make fun of the religion of Islam. They pay no attention to the firm evidences presented to them and are not concerned with truth and falsehood. They simply continue to live their lives with deep engrossment in the pleasures and delights of the worldly life. 
This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the word they play in doubt, that in doubt they are playing, that they play with the teachings. They take the teachings for a mockery. They take it for a joke. You know, whenever anything is mentioned to them that is serious, they take it for a joke. Sometimes they will turn a blind eye to it. They will not pay attention to it. At other times, they will object to it. And at other times, they will just treat it as insignificant and trivial and even look at it and laugh. When the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will tell them about life after death, life in the hereafter, they will look at him and ask him if that was the truth, if it was for real, as we say. When he will speak to them about paradise and about hell, they used to laugh at him. And they used to say, oh, Muhammad, are you saying that when we are dead and buried then, and our bones have become crumbled, you know, that we will gain life again and there will be something called a resurrection and then there will be a judgment? He says, yes, that is so. Every prophet who came from Allah spoke about the resurrection and the judgment and they just paid no attention to it and they just made fun of it. So Allah says they play in doubt because they had doubt about the teachings. Regarding their rebellious attitude to the truth, Allah revealed the following to the Prophet wasallam as a means of solace to him. He revealed to the Prophet wasallam as a means of solace and comfort to him. He said, then wait you for the day when the sky will bring forth a visible smoke. Telling the Prophet, O Prophet, wait until Wait for that day when the sky will bring forth a visible smoke covering the people. This is a painful torment. As it is mentioned here, that this is a means of solace and comfort to the Prophet wasallam as a consolation for him. Tafsilia. In other words, what it is meant to be, it is to tell the Prophet wasallam that, O oh, Prophet, you continue with your mission. Continue with your mission and you're preaching just as all other prophets did in the past. One day, the consequences of what they are doing will fall on them. That this that they are making a joke of, they will see the serious nature of it. One day they will see the truth of what you are saying. Because the people had a tendency of always challenging the prophets. They will normally say things like, if what you are saying is the truth, well, tell your God and your prophet, you tell your Allah and your God to bring down some punishment. So they will challenge even the prophets. Subhanallah. So Allah says, O Prophet, you wait. Wait until that day comes when the sky will bring forth a smoke, a visible smoke, which will be a painful punishment. This smoke will cover all of them. Allah says, and this is a painful torment. So as it is mentioned in the commentary here, Allah says to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wait, O Prophet, wait, have patience. You will see what will be the outcome of what they do. Wait, O Prophet, when the punishment shall come upon them on that day, at that time, the sky will bring about smoke which everyone will see. It will cover them. Now this smoke that is spoken about in this ayah here, verse 10, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to wait the smoke that Allah has promised to come in the form of a punishment, it will come. So the ayah speaks about a punishment which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has fixed to come for those people who disbelieve in the religion of Allah, disbelieve in the haqq at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The question is, what was this punishment? We know it is about the smoke. Did it come? Or is it from among the signs of the hour of judgment that will come just prior to the day of judgment? The commentators, the exegetes, and the great scholars from among the Sahabas radiallahu ta'ala anhum, they have explained this and they have stated regarding the smoke mentioned above in the ayah, the great companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala and said, when the Quraysh continued to disobey and disbelieve in the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he supplicated against them and said, "O oh Allah, 
increase your harshness upon the tribe of Mudar and make their years upon them the year, like the years of Yusuf salam with drought and famine. So he made this dua that they continued to not only disbelieve, but they continue to persecute the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and persecute and torture all those people who accepted Islam and accepted to believe in one God and accept the prophets in the past and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as the final messenger. And the people, Mudar, the people of Mudar, they are actually the Quraysh. The Quraysh that was the main tribe in Mecca to whom the Prophet ﷺ came. And the Prophet ﷺ was from the tribe of the Quraysh, was a big tribe, a large tribe. But many of them, if not all, they disbelieved in the Prophet ﷺ. They made fun of him. They ridiculed him. They, they tried their best to do everything they could have done to him, to stop him from preaching, to stop him from delivering the message of the truth. And they continued and continued, and they just wouldn't stop. And on one occasion, when they persisted in what they were doing, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made dua to Allah and said, Oh Allah, these people do not want to believe in your message, and they are making fun of your religion. Increase your harshness upon them, O oh Allah, and make their years like the years of Yusuf Alaihi Wasallam. During the time of Yusuf Alaihi Wasallam, Allah brought seven years of drought and famine. And on account of that hunger, starvation, thirst, it affected the people. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Oh Allah, increase your harshness over Mudar and make their years upon them like the years of Yusuf Alaihi Salam. That's Prophet Joseph, Prophet Yusuf Alaihi Salam, with drought and famine. On account of this, Severe hardships and suffering struck the tribe of Mother until they began to eat bones and decaying animals. It was harsh upon them because no rain was falling, so the ground could not produce anything. Food stuff was hard to get, and everything became difficult for them, even getting normal food to eat, grains, meat, proper meat, you know, no vegetation from the ground, no provisions. Subhanallah, it was very difficult. At that, that time of drought and famine, a man among them spoke to his brother who could hear his voice but was not able to see him on account of the widespread smoke that filled the atmosphere between the sky and the earth. After narrating this, Abdullah bin Masood said, There are five signs which already went. He said, at his time, five signs that came and it already passed. These signs are the smoke, he says, this smoke, the witness, this was a form of adab and punishment. Rome, where Rome that was dominated by the Persians and overpowered by the Persians, Rome was able to uh, conquer Persia and they won the battle. And they, they are, in those days, these were the two superpowers, the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. And they would always fight and they will conquer all the surrounding territories. So people who were the smaller tribes and smaller countries, they will have to have an alliance with one of these mighty empires, Rome or Persia. And they will always go at war. So on one occasion, Rome, who was a really Ahlul Kitab, they, they lost the battle against Persia. And uh, the people were asking, coming to the Muslims and asking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who you think, if you are a prophet, tell us who will win the next battle. Because that was a big thing. Like right now in the world at present, you have superpowers. And whenever anything is happening that is connected to the superpower or superpowers, the whole world becomes involved in that. And everybody is looking on to see what is going on and what is taking place and what's the next step. So the same at that time. So because of the fact that they asked that question and they were testing the ability of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Quran, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed the surah called Surah Rum, a room. And in that he said, Alif la mim ghulibati rum. Alif la mim, Rome has been dominated and overpowered. However, within a few years they will conquer and they will overpower Persia. 
and that came to pass. So the, the Rome, Romans conquering was a sign also because quite before many years or quite a few years before that actually happened, the, the ayah and the verses in the Quran were already revealed. And the Prophet wasallam mentioned that to the people. So what was mentioned in the Quran, after a few years it came to pass and that was a sign. The moon, the splitting of the moon, the season, Allah says also that they will, he will seize them, you know, in an adab, which was the battle of Badr and the Lizam. And that also refers to another thing that is mentioned in the hadith. Had this, this has been mentioned by Imam Bukhari as it is mentioned in Safa Tafasir. So Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala says that the smoke that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about, it came. The people out of hunger and starvation, they were so hungry that, and starving. And they were so weak and feeble because they couldn't even get water, proper water to drink. They couldn't get food to eat. They were eating carrion. They were eating skin. They were eating leaves, you know, because they were struck with seven years of harsh drought and famine. And uh, when they will speak to each other, you know, that, that they were suffering so much that when they opened their eyes, it was only smoke that they saw around them. You know, according to some narrations, it was actually smoke that filled the environment and atmosphere. Or it was on account of how they felt, their starvation and their thirst. They were just seeing smoke. They couldn't see anybody. It's just smoke they were seeing. And that itself was an adab from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So according to the commentary given by Abdullah bin Mas'ud, who was a, a great companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he mentioned that this sign of the smoke that Allah said to the Prophet, O Muhammad, wait until you see that smoke which will come from the sky. It will cover all of the people and that will be a terrible punishment and a painful torment. So that went already. That is according to Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala. However, according to Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala, one of the great commentators of the Holy Quran, from among the Sahabas, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, he and others, they said, the sign of the smoke as mentioned in the verse has not appeared as yet. They say it doesn't refer to that smoke-like thing came, that came up at that time. Instead, they are saying it is one of the signs of the day of judgment which will occur before the judgment day and will fill the atmosphere between the earth and the sky. When it touches a believer, he will catch a cold. And when it touches the unbelievers and hypocrites, it will create difficulties in their breathing. And they would be as if they are intoxicated. They will behave as if they are intoxicated because the smoke will fill their stomachs. The smoke will fill their stomachs and come out from their bodies through their nostrils, ears, and rear. So Abdullah bin uh, you know, Abbas radiallahu ta'ala mentions that this smoke is another smoke that is being spoken about, that this is a sign of the hour of judgment, that prior to the hour of judgment, this will be a sign, a major sign in other words, that will come about. Just like how the Dajjal and the Antichrist will be a major sign and the Gog and the Magog, the Yajuj and Majuj will be major signs, so to the smoke coming and actually filling the atmosphere, you know, and causing harm to people, that according to Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala and others, they say that this is actually what the eye is speaking about. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is being told, wait until that smoke covers the people, that will be a painful torment that will come to them. Regarding this, Abu Sariha, Huzaifa bin Asid al Ghifari radiallahu ta'ala, who was a companion, he said, The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked out to us from a room while we were discussing the hour. He then said, The hour will not come until you see ten signs the rising of the sun from the west, the smoke, so the smoke is mentioned as a sign here. That the beast, the Batul Ard, the emergence of Yajuj and Majuj, the appearance of Isa bin Maryam, the Dajjal, 
three cases of the earth collapsing, they are neither earth sinking, one in the east, one in the west, and one in the Arabian Peninsula, and a fire which will emerge from the bottom of Eden and will drive the people or gather the people, it shall stop with them wherever they stop to rest at night, as recorded in the Sahih of Muslim. So therefore, in this tradition, among the ten different signs of the hour of judgment, which are referred to as the major signs, the smoke is also one, which has been described in the tradition above, you know, that um, Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala mentioned about. Now, as it goes further to state, the above narration shows that the smoke mentioned in the verse, which states, then wait you, that is, O Prophet, you wait for the day, when the sky will bring forth a visible smoke covering people, this is a painful torment. It refers to the smoke which will be a sign of the hour of judgment. This is what this tradition says coming from Huzaifa bin Asid. This is the opinion of Ali radiallahu ta'ala, Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala, Zayd bin Ali alayhi rahma, Hassan alayhi rahma, Ibn Abi Mulaika alayhi rahma and others. They hold the opinion that this smoke that is mentioned in verse 10, where Allah says then, wait you for the day when the sky will bring forth a visible smoke. That smoke is uh, speaking about one of the major signs of the hour of judgment when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send it as a form of punishment to the people. So this is the second opinion. Now as it further states here, the first opinion given before, based on the explanation of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala, indicates that it refers to a smoke which went already as a punishment to the Quraysh when they disbelieved in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is what we have seen when he mentioned about how the Prophet wasallam made dua against them and Allah caused seven years of drought and famine to take them and because of that, they suffered a lot. And this is the opinion given by Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala, Mujahid, Abu Aliya, Ibrahim bin Yazid al Naqi, al dhahaq Atiya al-Awfi. It is the commentary which has been preferred by Hafiz ibn Jarir al-Tabari. So many great scholars have mentioned about this first opinion and uh, regarding the commentary of this, Imam Bukhari has also mentioned that in his Sahih compilation, that commentary given by Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala as to what happened during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam with the Quraysh. Now, it goes further and it states while explaining this, while explaining this opinion, and commentary given by Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala, Hafiz ibn Jarir as well as Hafiz ibn Kathir alayhi rahma mentioned the following narration in which the great Tabi scholar Masruq alayhi rahma narrates, we entered the masjid at Kufa and a man was reciting to his companions the day when the sky will bring forth a visible smoke. So Masruq says we went to Kufa in a masjid and uh, when we went there, we saw a man at the door. He was reciting an ayah of the Quran. That is verse 10 of Surah Dukhan, which states, Then wait you for the day when the sky will bring forth a visible smoke, covering the people. This is a painful torment. And then the man said to them, Do you know what that is? Do you know what this smoke is about? And the man said, further said, That is the smoke that will come on the day of judgment, yani prior to the day of judgment. He says, it will take away the hearing and the sight of the hypocrites and the unbelievers. But for the believers, it will be like having a coal, like you catch a coal and that's it. He, Masruk, then said, after we heard the man saying that, we then came to Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala and told him about that. We told Abdullah bin Mas'ud because Abdullah bin Mas'ud was a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he was still alive. So Masruk said, we went to Abdullah bin Mas'ud and told him what the man was saying. So Abdullah bin Masood was lying down and he became alarmed when he heard that. He was surprised that a man would even say that. And start up saying, certainly Allah said to his prophet, say, 
No wage do I ask of you for this, nor am I one of the pretenders. In other words, the Prophet wasallam was ordered by Allah to tell the people that this task I am doing by reaching out the message of Islam to you, I do not want any salary from you. I do not want a stipend or a wage from you. I do not want any money from you. I'm not asking you for anything. My wage, my salary, and my stipend is with Allah alone. Then he further said to them, No, I am one of the pretenders. I am not pretending to be who I am not. I am not pretending to be a prophet. Allah has made me a prophet. I am truthful. I am not pretending to tell you that I know things when I do not know. If you ask me and I know something, I will tell you. But if I do not know, I will tell you I do not know and I will wait for revelation. So Abdullah bin Masood recited this ayah to tell Masruq and, tell, and the others that when a man does not have knowledge about something, he should not pretend that he knows it. He should not say that he knows it. He should not behave in a manner as if he knows it. He must come outright and say, I do not have any knowledge about that. So what Abdullah bin Masood was saying, that this man who just um, gave the commentary regarding that, he should have told the people he doesn't know about the verse. And this is why he said, verily, it is part of knowledge that when a man does not know something, he should say, Allah knows best. I will narrate to you about that smoke, subhanallah. So Abdullah bin Masood gave a beautiful advice to Masruq and all the other uh, tabi'in scholars who were there, that it is part of knowledge that when a man does not know something, he says, Allahu a'lamu, Allah knows best. I do not know, Allah knows. And that is really a part of knowledge. So this is why in, the, in Islam it is stated that saying, I do not know, it's also part of knowledge. A man may say, well, how can a man say he doesn't know and that is knowledge? It is so because when a man doesn't know something and he actually admits it with the tongue that he doesn't know it, it is showing his humility. And humility is a part of ilm and knowledge. He is telling you that I am not pretending. I will not misguide you by saying something or speaking about something I do not know. He's been honest, subhanAllah. He's been truthful and trustworthy in that he's conveying to you something. He probably can say anything to you and make you believe it. But in his heart, he knows he does not know. And he wants to be honest and trustworthy and truthful to you. And it is out of humility that although he might be a scholar, it is out of humility he submits, he humbles himself. He says, I do not know about that, subhanAllah. So this is why Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala and told the people, it is part of ilm and part of knowledge that when a man does not know something, he says clearly, I do not know. And Allah knows best and he doesn't pretend to know. Then he said to Masruq and the others, let me narrate to you about that smoke. Why Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala says that? It is because he was there when this incident occurred. He, in fact, is the narrator for this incident in Sahih al-Bukhari, where he, Imam Bukhari, used his tradition, where he said what happened at that time, how the, the people of the Quraysh were actually not only disobeying, but they were being harsh to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were tormenting him. They were persecuting him. They were doing every single wrong thing to him. And he said, O oh Allah, create and increase your harshness upon them. Seven years, like the seven years of Yusuf alayhi salam, and Abdullah bin Masood was there. He saw what happened and he knew also who came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to beg for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to make dua. So this is the commentary that he gave. He said, when the Quraysh did not respond to Islam, Islam came and they did not respond positively to it. And they grew stubborn towards the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They became stubborn. To the and rude also, obstinate to, to, obstinate to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, supplicated against them that they would have years like the years of Yusuf alaihi salam of drought and famine. On account of this hardship and starvation, struck them to the extent that they ate bones and dead meat. This is what they had to eat to pass the days and the nights. They would look to the sky and see nothing but smoke. About this, Allah says, Then wait you, O Prophet, for the day when the sky will bring forth a visible smoke covering the people. 
This is a painful torment. Yani this will be a severe punishment to the people. At that time, a man came to the Messenger of Allah and said, O Messenger of Allah, pray to Allah to send rain to the tribe of Mudar for they are dying. So when they could not take it anymore, a man came and he said, O Muhammad, O Messenger of Allah, pray to Allah and ask Allah to send rain to the Mudar, that the Quraysh, because they are dying. So the Prophet wasallam prayed for rain for them and they got rain. Then the verse was revealed, Verily we shall remove the torment for a while. Verily you will revert. Allah says, yani referring to the dua the Prophet wasallam made, Allah says, we will remove it. We will remove it for a short while. We will remove the punishment for a short while. But after that, you would not learn a lesson. You will go back to kufra and shirk. That is what Allah is saying. Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala and said, Do you think that the torment will be removed for them on the day of resurrection? In other words, the commentary that was given was that the smoke will be a punishment just prior to the day of judgment or on the day of judgment as the man was saying. So Abdullah bin Masood is saying, look at this ayah here. Allah is saying, we shall remove the what? Punishment for a little while. He says, Allah will not remove the punishment on the day of judgment, nor the major sign and punishment that will come prior to the day of judgment. Allah will not remove that because that is sent to punish people. Allah will not remove it. But about this punishment, Allah removed it, which was the punishment of the drought and the famine. He says, when they were granted ease, they reverted to their former state of disbelief. So Allah removed the punished for punishment for a short while. He removed the punishment for a short while. But then what happened after that was that they enjoyed the removal of the punishment, that they started to get rain and they started to get food and life came back to normalcy. But they did not accept Islam. They did not believe in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They did not believe in Allah. They just went back on their heels and they turned back to what they used to do. Then Allah revealed on the day when we shall strike you with the great striking. Verily, we will exact retribution. Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala said this means the day of Badr. So therefore, quite a, a number of the famous uh, commentators, they have stated that it refers to the incident that occurred at that time where the people, they suffered because of that punishment which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent to them and they were looking and they were seeing smoke. Now, according to some commentators, it is possible, yes, that this occurred at their time. There is no doubt about this occur, the, the occurrence of this. You know, the Sahabas radiallahu ta'ala, the Imam Bukhari and many great comment, um, uh, compilers of ahadith, they have all recorded the narrations regarding what took place there with the people of the Quraysh. But besides that, there is also the smoke that will come and fill the atmosphere prior to the Day of Judgment. So the occurrence of this as a punishment there doesn't mean that that will not occur at that time. And that which will occur at that time doesn't mean that we cannot accept that this occurred at this time. But there are two separate things. <clears throat> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about the punishment that came to the Quraysh. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned about the major sign of the orb judgment, which will be the smoke. So that is in place. That will come like many, many other great signs. Like obviously during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, many different types of punishments came to the Quraysh. But it doesn't mean that punishment will not come again prior to the Day of Judgment. Punishment will keep on coming to people who disobey Allah and who deny Allah and reject the religion of Allah. So Surah Dukhan continues in verse 12 and says, They will say, Our Lord, remove the torment from us. Really, we shall become believers. This is what they said. Oh, our Lord, remove the, punish the torment from us. Really, we shall become believers. Really, we shall become believers. The verse explains that when the punishment came to them, they turned in supplication to Allah. When the punishment came to them, 
They turn in supplication to Allah, begging him to remove the punishment and also promising to believe in him and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if he removed it. So in other words, they made a promise because they were struck with difficulties, hardships and sufferings and they wanted out. So they made a promise and they said, oh Allah, uh, please remove this. And we will believe. And they also came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as it is narrated here in Tafsir Al-Qurtubi that when the Quraysh of Makkah began to suffer from hunger and starvation and also the smoke when they started to suffer on account of the smoke they came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said if Allah removes this punishment from us we will accept Islam. So this is what they said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also. If Allah removes this from us, we will accept Islam. So, the Prophet ﷺ did make dua. But, what was the response from Allah to their statement? That they are making a statement, you know, only, oh Allah, if you remove the punishment, we will be believers. Allah mentions about that. In response to their supplication, Allah revealed, revealed the following to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he said, How can there be for them an admonition at the time when the torment has reached them? How can there be for them an admonition? In other words, how can they take a lesson and how can they really believe when a messenger explaining things clearly has already come to them? In other words, what hopes there are for them to believe in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he came with so many signs, evidences, he performed so many miracles to them. He preached to them night and day. Everything they wanted, they got it, they saw it. There was absolutely no reason for them to have any doubt whatsoever. Yet, notwithstanding all of those things, they never believed in him. Now, they just got a little touch of hardships and sufferings. And they are promising Allah that only if he moves it away, they will believe. But for all the time that passed by, they had so many evidences and proofs and miracles being performed. And they knew the truthfulness of the Prophet wasallam. He grew amongst them. He was one from among that same tribe, the Quraysh. They knew him from birth. There is not a single thing that they could actually accuse him of. But all that, all those things came, passed by, they witnessed it, and they never for once believed in the truthfulness of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So Allah says, where will they believe from? Where, what, what are they saying that they will believe? There isn't really any hope for them to believe. When the messenger explaining things clearly has come already to them. So in this verse, Allah says, how can there be an admonition for them? How can there be a reminder for them? How can they really take this? It means how can they take a lesson and accept Islam at this time when the punishment shall descend upon them? When the Prophet Muhammad wasallam has already come to them with clear signs and manifest miracles and yet they did not believe in him. How is it that they will believe now when the punishment actually is really coming to them now? It wouldn't happen. Allah speaks about their conduct to the Prophet wasallam and says, in other words, Allah is asking a question. How would they believe now? They wouldn't believe. And Allah says, why? He says that. He says, then they had turned away from him and said, one, this Muhammad is one taught by a human being, is a madman. In other words, Allah is saying, this is what they used to say about the Prophet. That is it expected that overnight they will turn automatically? When for years they call him insane, they call him a madman, they call him one who is possessed by some evil jinn spirit. They said he was taught by somebody else. With all the days and nights he preached, they continued to turn away. So Allah says, then they had turned away from him. This is what he met from them. This was their conduct they had shown to him. And not, not only that, they turned away, but their statement, their ridicule, their words of humiliation that they use to him, that he is insane, he is majnoon. You know, all sorts of different words. The verse explains that when Allah's messenger, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, came to them, they turned away from him and rejected his teachings. 
Besides this, they mocked him and said that he was insane. This is what they said. This was their behavior to the Prophet ﷺ. Can any good be expected from them? Would they really believe in him as they promised in their supplication? While this was their conduct for many years, this is what Allah means when he says, how can there be an admonition for them when a messenger explaining things clearly has already come to them? How would they believe now? It means that they wouldn't really believe. They wouldn't really believe. In this verse, then they turned away from him and said, he has been taught by a man. Then it says, then they turned away from him and said he has been taught by a man. Yani Allah is a madman. In, in, in other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about how they treated the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That they turned away from him. He came to them. He preached night and day to them for many years. But they turned away from him. And besides that, they called him one who has been taught by another person. And he is insane and mad. This is what they did. So therefore, how is it that overnight, as we say, they're just going to believe in him? While commenting on this verse, Imam Fakhruddin Ar-Razi said, The unbelievers of Makkah had two opinions regarding the Holy Quran being recited by the Prophet They held two opinions. Some of them said that Muhammad learned the Quran from other people and was taught by a non-Arab slave of Banu Thaqif. This is what some of them were saying, that this man Muhammad, this Quran that he's reciting, he actually learned it from another person. And a slave, a non-Arab slave, a person who is not an Arab, an Arabic-speaking person, who is a slave of Banu Thaqif, he taught Muhammad the Quran. Hence, they used to call him Mu'allam, meaning that he was one taught. That was one opinion. Others stated that he was insane. And a jinn or a spirit had inspired him with the words of the Quran, when it possessed him. This was another opinion that they were saying that this man Muhammad, he is insane. <clears throat> and a jinn, a spirit had inspired him with the words of the Quran. So they were actually saying that the Quran really is the words of the shayateen and the satan and the jinns that possess him. And this commentary is given in Tafsir al-Kabir. Allah himself refuted these false statements of the Quraysh and cleared the Prophet ﷺ from such fabrications. While making it evident that the Prophet ﷺ was not insane, he said, in other words, they were using remarks against him, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he refuted them, and he cleared up the air, in other words, so that innocent people will not fall to the trap of these people, who will just begin to actually say things, so that other people will follow them. And this is a way that people try to block the minds of innocent people. This is the way that people try to get others to believe in lies that they are actually spreading. They use remarks against a person just in on, uh, only in order to block their minds. So therefore, somebody is saying something, he's preaching something, will be an honest person, an educated person, but somebody who may have an enmity against him, he begins to fabricate lies against that person and begins to slander that person and say all sorts of things to people. Those people now, this man has not done anything wrong to them, but they begin to dislike him and hate him. Why? Because of what other people, what other people incite into his mind and in his heart, what other people say. So these mischief makers and people of fitna, what they try to do by spreading rumors, false rumors, and uh, they actually use bad names against other people, they try to block the minds of people. So if they can actually create a bad uh, thought or impression about a person, then when he actually speaks to them or his message reaches to them, they will already be locked off. In other words, before they will actually meet a person, they will say, oh, he's a bad person. Or that person doesn't say anything good. Or that person doesn't teach any good. And that was a plot that the unbelievers used to use at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. So that there were many innocent people, people who have never heard the words of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ did not do anything wrong to them. 
All the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do, like the other Prophets in the past, go to the people and tell them that Allah is one, God is one, He has no partners, worship Him alone, and that He was a chosen messenger and a Prophet of God. That's all. Was there anything wrong in that? No, there is nothing wrong in that. But yet, those people who like to create mischief and fitna among others, and they want to block the minds of people and the hearts of people from accepting those prophets, like the, in the case of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they will begin to spread rumors and say, oh, this man is insane, you know. So since he's insane and he's mad, when he speaks to you, he doesn't know what he's speaking, so don't listen to him. So when the day arrives when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam actually came to those people, that's already in their minds and their head. And they will say, you know, so-and-so was saying that, He's mad, he's insane. Don't listen to him, don't pay attention. You know, and, and so many other things. They will say, oh, he's a poet. He's a poet. He's only making up poetry. He's just concocting and fabricating things. So don't listen. So therefore, this is what mischief makers will do. They will always block the minds of other people through their mischief. Whether it is lies, whether it is false allegations, rumors, whether it is the backbiter person, the search for things that do not exist in a person just to spread it. The objective is only one. So they will, they will turn people against others. That is the objective. That these people, they want those people to be with them. So they are turning the minds of people against others. So Allah, this is why whenever they use remarks against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah who sent his Prophet would clear that up in the Holy Quran. He will refute their their, their wicked statements and their lies in the Holy Quran. And at the end, the truth always stands. Everything that is false and everything that is based on falsehood will vanish one day. If not today, tomorrow. If not tomorrow, one day. But falsehood is built on a weak foundation. Falsehood, we must always understand that. Falsehood will always crumble to pieces. Falsehood cannot stand the test of time. If you lie, a per to a lie to a person today, you may get him to believe you. But that lie would remain forever. Very soon, that lie will become manifest as a lie. And that same person you told will realize that you lied to him or her. And then they will begin to look at you differently. They will begin to realize you are a liar and you are a dishonest person. Dishonest person. But the truth is always one. And the truth will always remain until the day of judgment. Because the truth is founded on a strong foundation. The truth is not shaky. It stands firm like a mountain pegged to the earth. Nothing can shake it. But falsehood, it actually crumbles the pieces. And falsehood will never stay forever. So when the Quran speaks about something, with all that they said against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the truth came out. Everybody considered them to be liars, and everybody in Mecca and Medina accepted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Just imagine that. Before he left the world, not only in Mecca and Medina, everyone all in the surrounding tribes, when he did not have one single follower, by the time he left the world, there were more than 124,000 people coming from far and wide who accepted his message because he was truthful. As for the lies they fabricated, as for the lies they made up, they just vanished in the thin air and they crumbled to pieces. They couldn't hold because falsehood tries to fight the truth but it is too weak to actually match up with the truth. So, so too, that continues. Until the world continues to exist, there will always be a fight between haq and batil, truth and falsehood. But, but haq will always remain outstanding. Truth will always remain. You stick onto the truth for 100 years and it will stand up. It will never fade away and disappear. But falsehood will always change because it crumbles to pieces. And know also the liars will always be known as the liars and the truthful ones will one day become manifest that they are the truthful ones. So it's the same thing that is here, that they try, they call the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by all these different names. They call him. Why did they call him by names when they knew he was not like that? I mean, the Quraysh, 
is his, was his own tribesmen. His own family members belonged to the tribe of the Quraysh. They knew that the Prophet Muhammad wasallam was not mad at all because they will trade with him. They will speak to him. They will actually uh, walk behind him. They will see his actions. They knew very well that he was not mad at all. But why would they call him mad? Why would they call him insane? They wanted to stop other people from listening to him. That's why. So they blocked the minds of other people. So Allah says, clearing the name of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He says in Surah At-Takwir, Verily, this is the word. Yani, the Quran is the word. It is the word which Allah has given a most honorable messenger Subhanallah, verily this is the word that this Qur'an was brought by the most honorable messenger Jibreel alayhi salam, that the Qur'an was brought by whom? It was brought by the most honorable messenger who was Jibreel alayhi salam. Owner of power, Jibreel alayhi salam was powerful, high rank and he was high in rank with Allah, the Lord of the throne. Obeyed by the angels, trustworthy. There in the heavens, he's trustworthy. And then, at the end of it, after speaking about the Holy Quran, who brought the Holy Quran? The Archangel Jibreel, alayhi salam, who is so respected, who has such a high rank in, in Jannah and in the heavens, who is trustworthy in the heavens. That is the angel, the mighty angel brought that Quran. And O people, Allah says, O people, your companion, Muhammad, is not a madman. Subhanallah. How can the Quran come in with Jibreel from the heavens come to a madman? Subhanallah. So Allah built up what? This statement from before explaining what the Quran is about. Explaining who brought the Quran from the heavens and then arriving at that conclusive statement that certainly your companion is not Majnoon, is not a madman, not insane. And further it says, while refuting the statement of the unbelievers that the Quran is made up of, of the words of jinn or Satan, as they said that a jinn possessed him and while he was possessed, the jinn taught him the Quran. Allah refutes that and says, and it, the Quran, is not the word of the outcast shaitan. How can the Quran be the words of Satan? Inna lillah. Allah condemns that statement outrightly. He says, and certainly the Quran is not the word of a jinn or of Satan. Allah says, fa'inna tathhabun. So where are you going with this sort of statement? O oh, unbelievers, what do we expect again from these lies? Verily, this the Quran is no less than a reminder to all the worlds. This is what the Quran is about. It is a reminder to the whole mankind, to the entire mankind. To whomsoever among them who wills to walk the straight path. In other words, whoever from among mankind wishes to walk the straight path, then that person will find the Holy Quran as the best reminder. Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar. Whoever wants to walk the straight path, whoever wants to do everything right, whosoever wants his speech to be good, his conduct to be good, his dealings to be good, whoever wants his life to be good, he will always find the Quran is the best reminder. But as for those people who do not really want goodness in their life, they just want to live and live and live and it doesn't matter to them how they live. And they really do not want to better themselves. And they do not want to go straight and do the right thing and speak the right thing and live the right life. They, the Quran will have no meaning to those people. The Quran will have no meaning in their lives. The Quran will not be a reminder to them and the Quran will not be a guidance because they do not want to be straight. And this is exactly a beautiful message from the Quran. So we know the Holy Quran is the, a guidance to man. But who is really guided by it? Those who want guidance. That is the answer. If a person does not want guidance and he has the Quran in his heart and in his hand, yet he will not be guided because he does not want to be straight. So the Quran says, for those who want to be straight, they will find 
the Quran to be the best reminder. And you will, unless that Allah wills, the Lord of the Alameen. And you cannot will on your own. You cannot desire to do something and it comes to pass. You just cannot wish for something to happen and it comes to pass. No, no. It is all about Allah's will. Allah's will is what actually comes about and it supersedes the will of man. As mentioned in Surah Taqwir, verses 25 to 29, with respect to their false allegation that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam learned the Quran from a non-Arab person, Allah refutes this and states, in other words, that was another allegation. They said that this Quran that Muhammad is, is reciting, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he learned it from somebody else. He learned it from a non-Arab person, non-Arab person who was a slave of Banu Thaqif. Allah refutes that also. And he condemns that statement outrightly also when he says, Say, O Muhammad, tell them, O Muhammad, Ruhul Qudus, the angel Jibreel is the one who brought down the Quran from Allah, the Lord of Truth. That is the one who brought it. No non-Arab slave gave you the Quran. Ruhul Qudus, Jibreel, the archangel, the mighty angel Jibreel alayhi salam, brought down the Quran from the skies, from the heavens. From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he brought it with truth. That it may make firm and strengthen the faith of those who believe. That's one thing the Quran does. It strengthens the iman of the believers, subhanallah. That is what the Quran does. You read the Quran. You study it, you read the translation, the more you read it, it is the stronger your iman becomes. The more you contemplate and think about it and you, you study it, the more your iman becomes stronger. And it is a guidance. It guides you. Subhanallah, the more we read the Quran, the more we are guided. The more we connect ourselves to the, the Quran, the more we are guided. And glad tidings to those who have submitted to Allah and the Quran it is a means of glad tidings to those, to the Muslims and the believers. It announces to them rewards from Allah, barakat and blessings from Allah, jannat in the hereafter and goodness in the hereafter. So verse 103 of Surah Nahal says, And indeed, we know that they, the polytheists and pagans, say it is only a human being who teaches him. So this is the allegation they made. Allah is saying to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, O Muhammad, we know they are saying this about you. We know that they say that a man has taught you. And who is that man? A non-Arab man. So Allah questions them and says, the tongue of the man they refer to is foreign, is non-Arabic. While this Quran is clear Arabic tongue. In other words, the man they are saying that taught you, that man is a non-Arab and he doesn't, does no Arabic. He can't speak Arabic. And this Quran is fully Arabic. So how can that be? I mean, aql, intelligence itself, can tell you that this is a lie. That this Quran from the beginning to the end is fully Arabic. And then yet, although it is fully Arabic, they are making the allegation that a non-Arab person who can't speak Arabic is the one who taught the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It cannot happen. So in this way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refuted those allegations they made against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So our time has come to an end today. We will close there. Inshallah, we will continue next week. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.